Well, good to see everybody here this morning. Got a lot of folks out of town today for Labor Day weekend, I assume, so I'm going to go ahead and preach down here. I don't like being 40 feet away from the first person in the first row of the assembly here. So uh, we're going to take a look at three stories from the book of Matthew today. So if you've got your Bible already there to Matthew 12, go ahead and turn back a page to Matthew 11. We're going to look at two things from Matthew 11 and one thing from Matthew 12, and we'll get to that here in just a sec. So by way of introduction, there are two words that I really like, two of my favorite words, finicky and fickle, finicky and fickle. It's the idea of not just being kind of picky. Like, I mean, we think of people as being persnickety or picky or just kind of particular about things. But the idea of finicky and fickle is you're going to change your mind quickly. Nothing is ever satisfactory to you. It doesn't matter what is brought out to you at the restaurant. You're going to find something wrong with it no matter what. You're going to tell them to take it back. It's just the idea of you are never happy, you are never satisfied, and you reserve the right to change your mind mid-sentence if, you know, you should, show, you should so feel that way. And Jesus, during his ministry, encountered a number of very finicky and fickle people. Now, you're probably wondering, what's with the vending machines? Well, we'll get to that in just a sec here. I think sometimes our attitude toward God, just as the attitude of the people in the first century toward Jesus, often is like a vending machine. We want God to have a button we can push, and I can just push that button and get exactly what I want, when I want it. And if it's not cold enough, if it's not bubbly enough, <clears throat> if it's not the exact right brand that I want, then I can call the 1-800 number and complain and get my money back and a voucher for a free this and that whenever I want. And I find vending machines particularly vexing. I, vending machines are the sort of thing like, it's almost like when, when, you are, when you're marooned on an island and you're like, boy, I'm glad to not be out in the middle of the sea. And then you look around and there's like nothing to eat there. Vending machines are when, you're, when it's 95 degrees and you're at the zoo and you're thirsty and you need something and you see the vending machine and you're like, oh, finally, salvation. Oh, and it's a Coca-Cola vending machine also, so it's even better. And you walk up and the thing is stocked with nothing but Aquafina water bottles. Or even worse, Powerade. You know, when, when you're expecting an ice-cold Coca-Cola and all they've got is blue Powerade, you can't help but be a little disappointed by that. Now, in the same way, Jesus talked about this generation frequently in his ministry. Have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to read a couple stories here in just a sec here. But Jesus talked about this generation, and he, he said that this generation, of his generation in the first century, this generation always wants, wants, wants whatever. This generation always asks for this, seeks for this. This generation is very picky, it's very finicky, and it's very fickle. You want the Messiah to come exactly how you want. You want him to come when you want. You want him to accomplish what you want. And you're going to complain if you don't get exactly what you want. The first story we'll look at, I'm just going to list the stories here real quickly, and then we're going to go back and actually study them. But the first story is from chapter 11, verses 7 through 19, and it talks about John the Baptist. And what did you go out to see when you went to see John the Baptist? Did you go out to see a prophet? You sure did. But then at the end of this story, he comes back around to, when you found John the Baptist, he was not eating or drinking. He was a strange man, and he said, he's a crazy dude. But then I came, and I was eating and drinking and acting like a normal person. And then you say, he's a glutton, and he eats with tax collectors and sinners. There is nothing that can please you. There is nothing that can please you. In a Second story from Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 through 24. He talks about how this generation and the people of Capernaum, the cities at the north of Galilee, I did a lot of miracles. I did a lot of signs and wonders, but you didn't repent. And I'll tell you what, there's going to be some very surprising people on the day of judgment who find judgment more tolerable than you. And then there's a third story from Matthew 12 that's very similar to this in Matthew 12, 38 through 42. 
There's some skeptical sign seekers who come up to, well, you know, you tell us a sign, show us a sign, give us a sign. And Jesus said, I'll tell you about a generation that seeks after a sign. I'll tell you about that generation that always wants signs. And there are people on the judgment day who didn't get to see nearly as much as you who had so much more vigor in their faith than you, like the people of Nineveh or the queen of the south who came seeking Solomon's wisdom. And I'm telling you, something even better than Solomon is standing before you today. And in each of these stories, what you see is people being finicky and fickle. It was never good enough. There was never enough miracles, never enough signs. He didn't come the way that they wanted him to. He didn't meet their expectations and their preconceptions. And today, just as back then, people want God on their terms. They want a convenient God. They want a God that's kept neatly in a box. A God that never does anything inconvenient or rude or judgmental or expects too much of them. People always want God available at the push of a button. A well-stocked, impersonal God who's keen to mind his own business. We bring a hefty set of expectations and preconceptions to God as well as to the Bible. And so whether you're talking 2,000 years ago or today, we're really talking about the same core problem. What do you want out of your Messiah? So let's go back to Matthew 11. Let's go and read this story, Matthew chapter 11, and let's pick up here in verse 7. We'll read the whole story, by the way, and then we'll go back and make some applications, okay? Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 7. Now, as these were going away, Jesus began to speak to the multitudes about John. That's John the Baptist. What did you go out in the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But why did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men try to take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you care to accept it, he himself is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children, and they say, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say that he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax gatherers and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds." And so what was the expectation that they had when it came to John the Baptist? He says, was he just a reed shaken by the wind? Now, if you were to go to the Jordan River in that time period, you'd see plenty of reeds swaying in the breeze. The reeds along the riverbanks were a very common sight. So what he's saying is, did you go out to see something that was just common, blah, boring, something every day, something mundane, something that was just easily accessible and always swayed with the breeze and did what he was told and followed the course of this world and he tickled your ears with good news and said nothing but nice things to you. Is that why you went to go see John the Baptist? Did you go want to see a man dressed in soft clothing in a palace? You can find plenty of those guys. There are plenty of people in the world who are just the yes men out there who will only tell you what you want to hear. We have it in our families sometimes. When our family members are not willing to draw a line in the sand. And I've seen it even in my own family, and it's hard to admit and hard to talk about, but even in my own family, my extended family that is, 20 years ago, a moral line that never would have been crossed, well, a cousin steps over it, a nephew steps over it, a grandson steps over it, 
and, and suddenly we will move the fence post we'll, or the goal, we'll move the goal line because, well, you know, I just didn't understand it at the time. And, and we keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it so that even in our own families, because we don't want Thanksgiving to be awkward, we won't draw the line in the sand anymore. Because we don't want Thanksgiving, you wouldn't want Thanksgiving to be awkward by saying something about sin, by saying something about morals. You wouldn't want Thanksgiving to be awkward. And we see it in our society as well, more broadly speaking. The yes men, the people who just tell us what we want to hear, who will just confirm for us the things that we already want to believe, because either it's politically correct or it's expedient when it comes to business relationships. Jesus says, why did you go see John the Baptist? Did you go see John the Baptist so you could just be told yes, like everybody else, like the people in soft clothing in palaces? Or did you go see a prophet? And I think, by the way, Jesus is giving the multitudes some credit here. He's saying, I know. You went to John the Baptist because you wanted to see a prophet. You went to John the Baptist because you knew on some level that his message was true. And he's giving them credit. You went to see John the Baptist because you knew he was different from other people. And I think implied in this statement is, so why is there so much conflict with us? As in between Jesus and the multitudes, Jesus and the Pharisees. I do think that most people are at least somewhat aware of their own faults and failures. Now, they might not want to accept it fully or acknowledge it verbally or do anything to change, but I think on some level, most people know there's some gnawing guilt in their life, that they're not doing something right. And Jesus comes along and offers the solution. Jesus comes along and explains what that guilt is all about. Here's why you feel guilty. Here's why you're ashamed. Here's why you find money and wealth and prestige and your job and all that stuff unsatisfying deep down inside. I'm Jesus. Here's the answer. And we push back on it. I think Jesus is kind of saying, why did you go see John the Baptist? You wanted to see a prophet. And oh boy, did you get a prophet. You got yourself a prophet. You got yourself a prophet. We need to learn to appreciate the challenge that comes with truth. And I say learn to appreciate because it does take some work. Like learning to appreciate taking your vitamins at night. <laughs> you know, you turn 40 and you got this handful of multivitamins now that you get. You didn't even know there was such a thing as vitamin D3. I'm like, I haven't taken the other two vitamin Ds yet. <laughs> Learning to appreciate a handful of vitamins. Learning to appreciate stretching before you go work out. Learning to appreciate that your core actually matters. I don't want to work my core. You got to work your core. It's essential. But that's what truth is. Truth is the hard message that actually builds up our lives and help us to withstand the challenges that come along from the earthly situations that we face. And you have to learn to accept truth. You have to learn to appreciate truth. That's what the Hebrew writer says in the very last verse of Hebrews chapter 5. As he brings this chapter to a close, he says in verse 14, But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. You got to practice that. You have to learn to appreciate truth and to have your senses trained to discern between what is right and what is wrong. And when what is right is hard to accept, maybe even more than ever, that's when you need to accept it. Hard preaching doesn't always go down smoothly, but hard preaching does chip away at hearts and calcified will. Now, it seems that John and Jesus both faced the same problem, which was contrary expectations. 
We thought John was going to be a certain thing. And when we went to the wilderness to see him, as it turns out, he's kind of a strange hermit wearing animal skins and eating bugs. If you've watched The Chosen at all, that TV series that chronicles Jesus and his disciples during their ministry, they talk about John, how he's, they call him Crazy John. And I, I can't imagine that people didn't have that kind of attitude. Like, you know, John, kind of a strange fellow. And Herod had that attitude. Like, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with John. I don't want to behead him, but I, I kind of enjoy talking to him. Kind of a weird fellow. John was a weird guy. And we, you know, like that was reality. But Jesus says, some of you see John and all you see is, he's got a demon. He's a crazy guy. He's got a demon. Well, what did people expect about the Messiah also? What they expected was like a 10 foot tall, like David clone wearing golden armor who was going to swing a giant sword and kill all the Romans and give them their country back. Now, I know that's silly. I'm hyperbolizing, of course. But when you've spent hundreds of years expecting your Messiah to come and just dominate and win victories and sit on a throne and instead the Messiah comes as this like regular Joe from Nazareth and he goes around the villages of Capernaum doing signs and wonders uh, humbly and he's just not what you thought he was going to be well I guess it's no surprise that they were a little bit disappointed by that. Uh, there's a quote here from one passage that I want to read from a commentary here. He says, the plain fact, this is from Barclay's commentary on Matthew, the plain fact is that when people do not want to listen to truth, they will easily enough find an excuse for not listening to it. They do not even try to be consistent in their criticisms. They'll criticize the same person and the same institution from quite opposite grounds and reasons. And that's what Jesus is saying. When he talks here about you're like children in the marketplace, what he means is you're like kids out there and you play a little ditty on your flute. And he said, well, how come you didn't dance? And then you do a funeral dirge. A dirge is just a, it's a song that's sung at funerals. It's like in a funeral procession, it's the sad song that's played to turn everybody into a bad mood on the way to the funeral. And he's saying, basically, you're like little kids in the marketplace. And we didn't sing and dance for you. John the Baptist came and you said, hey, do that trick that you do. You know, do that, jump through the hoop. John the Baptist, jump through the hoop. Do that thing. Oh, Jesus, hey, we heard, Jesus, we heard that you did miracles. Now you do the same miracles here that you did everywhere else. Remember in Nazareth? He's there teaching in the synagogue of Nazareth. And he says, you're probably going to quote the old proverb to me. Physician, heal thyself. You're going to ask me to do the same signs in Nazareth that I did in all these other communities. And there's a reason why he couldn't do very many miracles in Nazareth. Not because he didn't have the power to do them, but because they didn't have any faith. Ouch. Imagine going to your hometown and they're like, the golden boy has returned. I go back to Beaverton, Oregon, where I was born and raised. All right, Ryan, hey, Ryan, do that thing. Preach one of those sermons. You know those great sermons where you talk about silly stuff like vending machines? Do one of those sermons that we've heard you do. And then I come in and I, you know, lay the truth down. Well, that wasn't what we expected, Ryan. Same thing happened to Jesus. Hometown boy, heard a lot about you, heard you become quite the rabbi, Jesus. And instead he makes the claim to be the son of man, right in the middle of their synagogue service. Mm, it's no wonder the people in Nazareth tried to throw Jesus off a cliff. There's one other writer here that I really like. When he says here, Fowler's commentary on Matthew, he says, The fault of the people's dissatisfaction lay not in the fact that Jesus or John offered questionable alternatives, but in the fact that anything that varied from the preconceived notions of their detractors was suspect. Thus it was easy to question whether John be a real prophet of God or whether Jesus be the Christ, since neither neatly fit into the common prejudices. Do you do the exact same thing with God? That goes back to that vending machine idea. When I pray to God, I want God to do it exactly how I want, when I want, and in a way that's expected. God, I don't want any of those surprises. 
God, I don't want you to teach me one valuable life lesson. I'm not Job. You know, we don't, it's like, God, I want wisdom. And then God says, well, I'll tell you the path to wisdom is through some hard life lessons. I don't want the hard life lessons. I just want the wisdom. Well, I want to be a better husband. Well, I'll tell you how to be a better husband is you're going to have to be there for your wife when something bad happens, when she gets sick, when something horrible happens. Well, I don't want that part. I, just want, I, I mean, I just want the reward without any of the work. And so we push the button on the vending machine. And it's not giving us what we want. What I want is 200 calories of Coca-Cola. And you're trying to give me an Aquafina water bottle. Probably what you need is the water and not the calories. Nice as that Coca-Cola might be on a hot day, probably what you need is the water. Well, there's a second story. Let's keep reading here in Matthew 11. It picks right up here in verse 20. Then he began to reproach the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Pretty shocking statement, huh? Which, by the way, as a side note, I hate to get sidetracked here because we're going to run out of time because I always go down little rabbit trails. But it's a good one. I like this one. As a little side note, whenever people come along and say, well, I don't believe in God, and the reason is God hasn't shown himself. I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with God. If God would just do one miracle, I promise I'll believe in him. Just all God has to do, God just has to appear in the sky and show himself to me. And if, if God just does one miracle, if God just answers one prayer, all God has to do is one miracle and I'll believe in him. You know what you can do is open up Matthew 11 verse 20. Read it to that person and say, are you sure about that? Because I know of some people who saw lots of miracles and didn't repent. Or go to the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and say, I know some people who spent 40 years seeing miracles and they all died in the wilderness. It's not a matter of the miracles, it's a matter of the heart. Which is exactly what he gets to in verse 21. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if, miracle, if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You shall descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. More tolerable for Tyre and Sidon and Sodom than for Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum, primarily Jewish communities? Now, these three communities were at the north of the Sea of Galilee, and they witnessed many of Jesus' miracles, but repented not. Tyre and Sidon appear numerous times in the Old Testament as being these objects of judgment for God. And there's several passages I've included from the Old Testament for the sake of time. We're not going to go through all of them. But there's a lot of Old Testament references that talk about the destruction and judgment of Tyre and Sidon because these were wicked nations. These were wicked cities. Uh, and we don't have to talk too much about Sodom because Sodom was famous for its licentiousness. It has an entire category of sins named after it, after all. How offensive do you think that was to speak to these primarily Jewish, law-abiding, synagogue-worshipping communities and to say, it's going to be a lot easier for Sodom on the Day of Judgment than it will be for you. What did he just say? I mean, I don't know exactly what a proper uh, modern parallel would be, but I, some of my best friends in the world are, are Southerners, deep Southerners, you know, Southern fried through and through. <laughs> and, I, and I love living in Memphis, by the way. I love it here. It feels like home to me. Um, but I had a very good friend of mine who was an elder uh, for a church I used to preach for. He's a Kentucky guy. He's leave, living in Phoenix, Arizona. He always called Kentucky the promised land. Every time you go back and visit, i got to go back to the promised land. You know, it, it's hard to believe for people who live in the Bible Belt that God could possibly have any mercy or grace for anyone living in Las Vegas, Nevada, or San Francisco, California, or dare I say, even Portland, Oregon. 
And yet up in Portland, Oregon, my parents live in Portland, Oregon. I'm going to hope that, I'm going to hope that God doesn't have fire and brimstone reserved for Portland, Oregon in any time in the near future because my folks still live there. But I suppose the modern parallel would be if I was to go to some great, beautiful, conservative, Bible Belt southern town and say, it's going to be more tolerable for Las Vegas, Nevada on the Judgment Day than it is for you. It's going to be more tolerable. It's going to be more tolerable for people in the Tenderloin in San Francisco on the Judgment Day than it will be for you. How offended would you be by that? That's what Jesus is saying. Now, let's be clear about this. This is a very important point to make. Let's be clear. More tolerable does not equal saved. And I think sometimes we kind of we uh, overreach a little bit there. We go, well, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom. Does that, is he saying that Sodom is actually going to go to heaven and that the people of Capernaum are not? Or Tyre and Sidon are going to be like overlooked and, and that they're going to go to heaven? Like, he's not saying Sodom is saved. What he's saying is on the judgment day, Sodom is going to look at its case and go, I guess I'm getting what I deserve. Whereas Capernaum is going to be over here like those folks in Matthew 7 going, well, Lord, Lord, hey, hey, Lord, Lord, did we not? Did we not do many things in your name? Hey, wait, no, you can't send us to hell, Lord, Lord. Who's going to find that more tolerable? He's, he's speaking, of course, using hyperbole here, as Jesus often does. He's exaggerating his point to try and, to try and drive his point home here. And so let's be careful not to kind of like uh, misapply what Jesus is saying, but let's be real about this. The judgment day is going to have a whole line of people who can say, well, I went to church every Sunday. Doesn't that count for something? I even wore a tie. Some of you this morning are not wearing a tie, I see. Is it, isn't this going to count for something? On the, like, come on the judgment, it's got to count for, I hate wearing a tie. I hate it. I only wear a tie once a week. But the judgment is going to be filled with people just like that. I was from Capernaum. I saw the miracles. Yeah, but did you repent? I saw the miracles. I was there at the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, I was sitting in the back, picking at my teeth, daydreaming, wishing it was lunchtime. I was there, though. But did you hear the sermon? Did you respond to it? Did you actually do anything? Ouch is all I'm going to say on that one. Now go to Matthew chapter 12. There's one more story. I know we're just about out of time here. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus has one more story to tell. Verse 38. Now, some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil, an adulterous generation craves for a sign. I always wonder, why does he use the word adulterous there? It's repeated again in Matthew 16 a little bit later on. That seems like an odd word to say, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Here's the only way that it kind of makes sense to me, as far as just kind of putting it in real life terms. How would you feel about a spouse who was always overcompensating about everything? How would you feel about a spouse who always wanted you to, to prove yourself to him or to her? How would you feel about a spouse who, who always, you know, who could never just be content in the marriage, but was always like challenging things in the marriage, pushing things in the marriage. How would you feel about a spouse who, who was always like, how come you don't talk to me the way you used to? How, how, come, you don't, how come you don't say, I love you the way that you used to? And that was constant, like, like constantly, always. At some point you got to start wondering like, is something going on with you? Is something going on behind the scenes with you? You're, you're my spouse. You know that I love you. I've never done anything to cause you to question, but all you do is question, 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 challenge, challenge, challenge. You're never satisfied. You're never content. You're, you're always critical. Like, at some point, you have to start asking, 
is there something going on? An evil and adulterous generation looks at its Messiah and says, jump through hoops. An evil and adulterous generation looks at its Messiah and says, not good enough. An evil and adulterous generation says, I'm going to need a little more from you. An evil and adulterous generation. An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, yet no sign shall be given it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall stand up with this generation of the judgment and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south shall rise up with this generation of the judgment and shall condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold something greater than Solomon is here and I love how we've we've now transitioned where in the previous story in Matthew 11 he's talking about Sodom and Tyre and Sidon it'll just be more tolerable for them they they're not saved they didn't repent they're they're still condemned but it will be more, more tolerable in the sense that they understand clearly why they are condemned now we've transitioned to, now we have these Gentile nations, whether it's Nineveh or the Queen of Sheba, we have these Gentiles who heard the message and also repented at the message. And the Ninevites will be saved. Why? Because they heard the preaching and it was good enough and they didn't need more. It is amazing, isn't it? You read that story of Jonah. How many miracles did Jonah perform? I mean, when he was in Nineveh, you know, clearly healing people. No, not none of that. Bringing people back from the dead. He didn't do that. Feeding 5,000. No, jo Jonah did none of that. You mean no miracles, no signs, no wonders? You mean they just heard his preaching and repented and the preaching was good enough? The queen of the south, she came and she got, to, she got to sit and Solomon, Solomon got to do like magic. No? You mean she just sat at Solomon's feet and learned divine wisdom from him and, and the wisdom was, was enough? Yep. And they will rise up in the resurrection on the judgment day and by their example, by their example, they will indirectly judge those who refuse to repent. The sign of Jonah is probably the idea of him being in the belly of the sea monster three days and three nights and the son of man shall be in the earth three days and three nights. Don't let that trip you up, by the way. That's just a colloquialism, not literally three full days and three full nights. But in the same way that we might use, I'll be there in a minute. Do we literally mean 60 seconds or do we just mean I'll be there in a short time? When Jesus says three days and three nights, it's a Jewish colloquialism for around three days. So don't let that trip you up. But the men of Nineveh and the queen of the south, both Gentile and previously ignorant of things pertaining to God, accepted truth enthusiastically with meager knowledge and no miracles, they were more faithful than the generation of Jesus' time. So we'll end with this. What are the preconceptions that you have about God, about Jesus, about the Bible, about his church? Which button on that vending machine are you slamming down going, just give me what I want? We have to be really, really careful about that because these three stories all clearly show that Jesus is saying, I'll lay the truth out for you. Whether it's John the Baptist and his preaching, my preaching, Ryan's preaching, the message of the Bible, we're going to lay truth out. And it's up to each one of us to respond to that truth in the right way. Let's go and end with a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed to our Bible classes. God, I thank you so much for another wonderful day of life, a day full of incredible blessings, and we want to thank you for those things. We could, never, we could never number all of them. We could never name all of them. But we want to thank you in particular that we get to be here today. We thank you for our bodies and for the ability of those bodies to do your work. 
However it is that you have granted us talents and abilities, we thank you so very much that we get to go do those things in your name, in your service. God, we thank you that we get to worship today for what a privilege and a blessing it is to be together with our church family. We want to thank you so much for the witness of your word and the incredible true stories of Jesus, the Messiah, of his disciples, of your followers throughout the, the years after his ministry, who followed after you, who listened to the words of the apostles, who accepted that pattern of true and wonderful Christian behavior and taught it to other people. We thank you so very much for each and every one of our members. We know many of our members are traveling today. We ask that you grant them safe travels. We thank you that they get to spend time and go on vacations with families and to see their loved ones in other places. But we do pray that they come back safe and sound at the end of that journey. God, we thank you for all these and so many other blessings. In your son's name we pray, amen.